Hey everybody, this is Mr. Bortnick with AP Calculus AB. We're in unit one, limits and continuity. And today's topic is topic 1.16, working with the intermediate value theorem. Enjoy. All right, for 1.16 intermediate value theorem, uh, this is the last section of chapter one. Yay, last section. Um, we're gonna be getting into review after this section uh, and then leading to our chapter one test. And so, um, Today's, today's notes are on what's called the Intermediate Value Theorem, which is the first of three major theorems in AP Calculus. Uh, we're going to talk about this one, and then we'll have a couple in some later chapters later on. Let's start with uh, what, the, what it says. So the Intermediate Value Theorem, uh, specifically for continuous functions, a.k.a. the IVT, says that if a function f is continuous... from x equals a to x equals b, then every value between the outputs f of a and f of b exists at some point in the interval from a to b, including those endpoints. So if f is continuous from x equals a to x equals b, then every value between f of a and f of b exists at some point in the interval from a to b. Uh, graphically, let's talk about what this means. So I'm going to just draw sort of an arbitrary curve. We'll say it starts here and maybe ends over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to label uh, some, some points here. I want you to visually see what we're talking about in this particular uh, theorem, the intermediate value theorem. So we'll start with our leftmost point. We're going to call this our a value. That's x equals a is where it starts. And our b value will be where it ends. Now, since we're calling this the function f of x, that means that the outputs for the for these functions would be, you know, we plug in a, we plug in b. So the outputs would be whatever the y values are when uh, we have f of a and the y value f of b. Whatever those y values are, 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 are going to be the y values on the axis. Now, what is this saying? We're saying, okay, if f is continuous. So first off, this is a huge, huge, huge deal. The intermediate value theorem only works if we're talking about a continuous function, because if it's not continuous, if it's got any discontinuities, uh, it could be doing all sorts of other things. But what's it saying? It's saying if it's continuous between x equals a and x equals b, then our conclusion, every value between f of a and f of b exists at some point in the interval between x equals a and x equals b. Right? This is giving us an interval or interval notation, talking about x values for that. So what this is saying is, you know, I can take any arbitrary y value. Let's say we've got this y value here. So let's say that this is uh, some value c. So I'll say that this is a, an output of c. That ultimately what we're saying here is if I'm starting up here at f at uh, when x equals a at the output of f of a and I'm ending here when x equals b at the output of f of b, there is no way if it's continuous that I can get from here to here without crossing this green line along the way, right? This green line is some arbitrary y value, I'm calling it f of c, but there, you know, my function could go down and then over, it could oscillate back and forth and then go over, it could look like what we've got here, but there is no way to get from this point right here to this point right here without crossing that green line if that function is continuous, right? If it's got like a, a step or a jump and it's discontinuous, sure, it could. But uh, what we're saying is, you know, we can, we can set this green line really anywhere in between these two uh, points as long as it's between the outputs of f of a and f of b. Anywhere where this green line is, the function is going to have to cross that green line at least once. So it, the, it exists. The, every value between f of a and f of b exists at some point in the interval from a to b. That is what our intermediate value theorem says. 
Um, and it should seem pretty straightforward. Of course, if I'm going from here to here, I would have to hit that green line, right? There's no way I could get from here to here. But this is a mathematical, you know, theorem. And, and really, it's the basis of a lot of rules that we're going to be having coming up. So it's sort of a foundational rule in AP Calculus. All right, let's jump into some problems and what this might look like both on the AP exam and in some practice. Below is a table of values for a continuous function f of x. We've got x values. We've got f of x values. Key piece, they're telling us it's continuous. So we know, first off, because it's continuous, that the IVT, the Intermediate Value Theorem, applies. We can use it because they told us it's continuous. If they did not tell us it's continuous, then we would not be able to use it. All right, so number one, um, on the interval from 0 to 9, x is between 0 and 9, what is the minimum number of zeros? The minimum number of zeros. Now, zeros, if we think back to algebra 1, algebra 2, are places where the y is equal to 0, or where f of x is going to be equal to 0. So if we're going between from 0 to 9, and we're looking at the y values here, where do we have to, have to go, uh, where does it have to be 0? Well, if I go from x equals 0 to 3, we see it starts with an output of 1 and it goes to negative 5. There is no way for me to get from 1 to negative 5 without hitting 0 along the way. There has to be a 0 between, between those somewhere on that function. Similarly, between negative 5 and 3, there has to be at least one 0 on there to get from negative 5 to 3. From 3 to 7, I don't have to hit. I don't have to pass zero along the way. That's not gonna not gonna count. I don't have to. But to get from seven back down to negative one, I'm gonna have to hit zero along the way as well. So I would say that the minimum number of uh, zeros in this one are three of them. So three zeros. Uh, that would be minimum for this function. Now a key thing to understand looking at this table, we do know that it's continuous, but we don't know what's happening between 0 and 3, or between 3 and 4, and between 4 and 8 and 8 and 9. This function could be doing all sorts of things, right? We just don't have that information, um, and so we can only use what we know, and we can only, you know, we, we can't say, you know, for example, there might be more than 3, we don't know, but this is just the minimum that there has to be based on the intermediate value theorem. Number 2. On the interval from 4 to 9, so we're only looking at this part of our table because they're only saying between x equals 4 and x equals 9, so these three over here. What is the fewest possible of times uh, f of x has to equal 1? So let's erase what we've got here. What's the fewest possible times that, uh, that f of x has to equal 1? So if I'm going from 3 to 7, does it have to hit 1? No, it doesn't. But to get from 7 to negative 1, I have to hit 1 along the way because 1 is between these two numbers, which means that it's guaranteed by the IVT to hit 1 at least one time. And so that is the fewest possible times it could be. We could, you know, in this case, what, the reason why it's saying fewest is, you know, between 3 and 7, it could be at 3, it could drop down to 1 and then come back up to 7, but there's nothing here that says it it's, has to do that. Um... And so the IVT only guarantees if the output is between the two given outputs. That's why it has to be between 7 and, and negative 1, because 1 is between 7 and negative 1 for that. Number 3 on the interval from 0 to 4, so we're only looking at the first couple of uh, values in this table. Must there be a value of uh, x for which x f of x is equal to 2? Um, so in this case, must there be, we're, we're essentially being asked to... to verify and to talk about the IVT here. Uh, does there have to be one? Well, from 1 to negative 5, no. Right? From 1 to negative 5, it could just go straight down to negative 5 and not hit 2 along the way. But if I'm going from negative 5 to 3, I have to hit 2. Right? There's no way I can get from negative 5 to 3 without hitting 2 along the way. So what does, what does my explanation look like? We're going to say, well, yes, it does. Right? There must, must there be a value? Yes, there does. And I'm going to say, since the function is continuous, so since the function is continuous, the IVT, the Intermediate Value Theorem, applies. So yes, since the function is continuous, the IVT applies. So again, remember, if we're going to be able to use the, uh, the Intermediate Value Theorem, we have to say that it's continuous. And... We can say that specifically on the interval, on the interval uh, where x is between, looks like three and four, um, 
there must be an output such that f of x is equal to 2. So since the function is continuous, the IVT applies. On the interval from 3 to 4, there must be an output uh, where f of x is equal to 2. All right, number four, last one. On the interval from 4 to 8, could there be a value of f of x? Well, the IVT guarantees that there either is or isn't. Now, if we look from 4 to 8, we're looking at these particular values here. Could there be a value where f of x is equal to negative 2? Sure, there absolutely could because we don't know what's happening at 5 or 6 or 7 when these x values. We don't know what's happening at all the decimals in between those. So totally it could be, but it's not guaranteed by the, by the intermediate value theorem. And so uh, here's what my response for this would be. We would say, yes, it is possible. Uh, but I'm going to say, but it is not guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem, by the IVT. So because we, because we don't know what's happening in those values, we, you know, it's totally possible. But if, there, if this were to, to change the text and say, must there be a value of x uh, where f of x is equal to negative 2? No, there, there doesn't have to be because the, the intermediate value theorem doesn't guarantee it. And more reasonably, if we're going from 3 to 7, if we're just going 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 along the way, I don't have to hit negative 2, right? There's no reason, uh, unless they tell me otherwise, that I would have to, but it totally could be. All right, that is it for number four. We've got practice problems for you to try. Again, this is our last section of chapter one. Um, try out the practice problems. Tr check out the test prep problems at the end. And as always, please bring questions uh, that you've got to class and to office hours. Have a great rest of your day.